praises of my people. In other words, if I could ever get people to make a corporate sound, to get out of themselves and into the divine moment, to stop thinking about me and start thinking about the we, he said, there I will command the blessing, life forevermore. Your miracle is one partnership away. Your miracle is one prayer partner away. Your miracle is one agreement away. You've been trying to do it by yourself, but I'm not just fighting for me. I'm fighting for we. Amen. Men of God, can we hear you roar in here tonight? Come on, give God a shout. Hallelujah. The sound of a warrior. As the man of God said, uh, you can be seated in the house of God. We're just honored to be here. And uh, I know we've already had an opportunity to hear a deposit from God. I, I will release what the Lord's really given me to release. Uh, but I'll get right into what God has put in my spirit. Uh, thank you, Pastor Rob, for releasing that word. Are you guys thankful that God sent the man of God with the word in his spirit? Man of God, if you could just give me a little something, just a moment, and then I'll have you shift off. And we want to do the same thing. I know uh, this is a little bit different going straight into another speaker, um, but, but it would be unruly of me, out of protocol of me, to get right into the Word of God and not honor the leaders who have helped bring us together. Uh, I say this a lot of places, but we are having the first opportunity to meet tonight, so I just want to put this in your heart. Uh, a lot of times what God does to release harvest into our lives. There's a number of ways when you read scripture that God shields the harvest that he has called us to walk into. And so he finds places that he hides harvest in. One of the things that he hides harvest in is a seed. Everybody say a seed. A seed is not just the money that you give. Seeds can be decisions. Seeds are intentional actions with an expectation for a future reward. A seed, the way I define it, is the future broken down in soulable form. When God gives you a seed, he takes your future and breaks it into a manageable portion and puts it in your hand today. Because none of us have the capacity to hold all of our tomorrows, God goes to tomorrow and breaks it into a seed and gives it to us today. And God said the only people who can guarantee a tomorrow are people who rightly sow the seed they have today. God hides your harvest in your seed. And so that's why I never miss an opportunity to put seed in the ground. Because the one who has expectation for a harvest in my future is the one who has sown intentionally in my present. Amen. And God also hides harvest in leaders. You'll find through the Bible that so often when the people would cry out for harvest, God would raise up a leader. Israel cried out for deliverance. God gave them Moses. Israel cried out for harvest. God gave them Gideon. The people cried out for salvation. And in the fullness of time, Christ was manifest. God hides harvest in the person of his leaders. And so you cannot access the harvest God has given you if you dishonor the leaders God has put in front of you. To extract what God has for my future, Elisha, I have to honor the mantle he dropped in my face, Elijah. What God has given me to do is in my ability to honor God has put in my life to serve and so we are grateful for the leaders who brought this together today we know that we would not be in this moment where we could receive what God has for us had it not been for their incredible vision so we want to thank God for pastors Bobby and Kim Atwood we want to thank God for pastor Rob we want to thank God for pastor Ron and the entire team who brought this together come on can we put our hands together for incredible leadership of man church with the vision to raise up warriors in our generation the greatest disease in our day is fatherlessness. If you can get men to understand who they are in God, you can change an entire generation forever. But God is trying to stir up his men. I was at a men's meeting with hundreds of men a few months ago. The Lord put a word in my spirit in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 29, matter of fact. When the Lord began to show and he prophetically said through Isaiah, he said, hell has opened wide her mouth. Hell's gates have been spread abroad. But before he released that particular word, he gave the reason why. He said the reason why hell has opened its mouth wide is because the honorable men are famished. When honorable men are in famine, hell has a heyday. 
He didn't say that hell is having a heyday because honorable men don't exist. He said because honorable men aren't being fed. If we can feed the honor in man, we can shut the gates of hell over our generation. That's why we brought you to he- together tonight to put something in your spirit that feeds the honor, the manner of man that you are. Amen. I've got a couple of scriptures I'm going to use, but what I'm really going to talk about is prophetic. Uh, this first scripture is probably longer than uh, most of my particular passages, but I do want us to walk through this together. Um, I know you've been up, down, up, down, up, down. We're doing squats tonight. Amen. If, if you could jump to your feet as we just read this last portion here and uh, we'll get right into the word. You have your word with you tonight. I uh, won't keep you up all night. But first Samuel chapter number nine, it's going to be a bit of a lengthy read, but I do want to just put this in our heart. If you don't have it, we brought it to you on the screen. Verse number one. Everybody there say amen. amen. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, and the son of Aphia, a Benjamite. Everybody say a Benjamite. A mighty man of power. And he had a choice and a handsome son whose name was Saul. Everybody say Saul. There was not a more handsome man or person among them in the children of Israel. I'm in the New King James, by the way. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than all of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. Everybody say lost. And Kish said to his son, please take one of the servants with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And so he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And then they passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. Verse 5. And when they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to a servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and be worried about us. And he said to them, Look, there is in this city a man of God who is an honorable man. That's the manner of man he was. All that he says will surely come to pass. Look at somebody say, What God says will surely come to pass let us go there perhaps he can show us the way that we should go a few more scriptures verse number 15 we'll skip ahead a little bit now the lord had told samuel in his ear the day before saul came saying tomorrow about this time i will send you a man from the land of benjamin you shall anoint him commander over my people israel that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. The people cried, God raised up Saul. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This is the one who will reign over my people. Then Saul drew near, a couple more verses, to Samuel in the gate. Please tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am he. Go up before me to the high place, uh, for you will eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for the donkeys, they were lost three days ago, but do not be anxious. They have been found. On whom is all the desire of Israel? Verse 21, I'm done right here. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? As the Lord put this word in my heart, I thought about how to title it. And sometimes that can be challenging because you can title by the by the problem you're dealing with or you can title by the solution you feel the Holy Spirit is going to bring. If I would have titled this by the problem, it would have been the title, Something is Missing. If I titled it by the solution, it would be Shift What You're Seeking. So I want you to do me a favor before you sit down and tell three men, Shift What You're Seeking. Shift What You're Seeking. Shift What You're Seeking. What are you looking for and where are you looking for it? You can be seated in the presence of the Almighty. Uh, There's a particular passage in 2 Kings chapter 6 where there's a story of the prophetic camp being built. The sons of God are being established and the the, the prophets are building uh, new tents because they're expanding. They're reinventing themselves. Now Elisha is leading the sons of the prophets. Elijah has transitioned forward. The double portion is on Elisha's life. And there is a son of the prophet, a prophetic man, who grabs an axe from a friend of his and he begins to cut down the trees. 
And as he's cutting down the trees to rebuild, to reinvent, to expand, to get the tools that he needs for his increase. A lot of times, men, we don't realize the reinvention that we desire comes with tools that are required. We want to reinvent. We want to expand. We want to move further. But there are tools that we need to effectively reinvent our lives in the image of God. That really is what fivefold ministry is for. It's to equip the saints. It's to weaponize you for what God has called you to do. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 talks about the weapons of our warfare. They are not carnal, but they are mighty through God uh, to pulling down of strongholds. That word warfare, when you study that out, actually means divine career. It actually means divine assignment. It doesn't mean what a lot of times we think it means. It comes to mean that. But the foundational understanding of warfare is divine assignment. And so what Paul was saying is the weapons of our divine assignment are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It means that God raises up men on divine assignment and weaponizes them to accomplish what he has called them to do. The issue is if you try to do what God has called you to do in the flesh, you won't have the might to accomplish what God has anointed you for. And sometimes men can get frustrated because we're trying to accomplish things we think are in the vision of God, but we are not doing it with the weapons God provides for divine success. And so our frustration is with God, but it's really I grabbed the wrong equipment. Somebody say I'm being equipped tonight. I'm being equipped. So, so this man grabs the tool that he needs to cut down and reinvent his life. And as he's chopping at the tree, the Bible says that the axe swings into the water. And the water actually swallows up that axe. He runs to Elisha and he says, I lost the axe, master. It was borrowed. And so that borrowed axe, the axe is the prophetic edge of the Holy Spirit. The axe is a sharp weapon of the spirit you can use to tear down natural obstacles and barriers. The axe is something God will put in your hand that has an edge necessary to plow through uncharted territory. But the Bible says that the man began to declare, even as a man of God, that the axe head was actually borrowed. See, Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. It says, pay whatever price you have to pay to obtain truth for yourself. And once you own that truth, don't give it up for any price that they offer you. Truth has to be owned. The problem with this particular man of God, though he was anointed, though he was prophetic, though he had the gifts of the spirit, though something was moving on his life that God had put in his life, the truth that he used was borrowed from somebody else. And borrowed truth is always less effective than truth you actually own and possess. See, if you take my truth and try to use it tomorrow, it'll work for a few minutes, but eventually it'll slip out of your hands because you don't own it yet. That's the problem because men think I can take your truth and change my life, but I have to own the truth before I can effectively use the truth. Amen. But the question about ownership is, are you willing to pay the price? Ask somebody, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing? Uh, because if all you do is come to church and borrow praise, when the enemy comes against your life, you won't have enough power in your praise to push that enemy back. If all you do is come to church and borrow somebody's hand clap, when you actually need it in your prison like Saul, Paul, and Silas, the gates won't open because it's a borrowed praise. Your praise ain't effective until you own your praise. Your belief ain't effective till you own your belief. You got to get a handle on the things God is saying in your life. Tell somebody you got to get out of spiritual debt. Come on. You got to own this thing, baby. Oh, you got to own the word. You got to take it home and work it for yourself. You can't borrow my revelation of scripture. My revelation of scripture won't work for you in a time of shadowy place. When you're walking through the battle of the shadow of death, you need your own revelation from God. You can't borrow my prayer life. When I bring somebody to the altar and God gives word of knowledge and they get set free, what you're functioning in is my anointing. But we, when there is no service for you to come to, you need your own anointing to lay your hands on your own kids and see the devil afflicting their life, leave them. 
Come on, you are anointed enough to man your house. Hallelujah. God brought you in this room to give you a fresh anointing so you don't have to borrow the pulpit's anointing, but you got something in your mouth. You got something in your hand. You got something in your kingdom account that you can put a demand on to shift your circumstances. Do I got anybody here that hears me? Somebody say yes. Come on, shout yeah. yeah. See, this man's using borrowed truth. Borrow prophetic reality, borrowed edges, and it works for a little bit. They look saved for a while. They look strong for a while. Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? But when it comes to relationship, I never knew you. You were functioning in somebody else's anointing, Sceva and his seven sons. I cast you out in the name that Paul preaches. That's a borrowed revelation. The problem is that devil's going to get up and beat your butt because you don't own the name yet. Hallelujah. Some men in here have been, I'm talking prophetically now, some men in here have been losing battles you are called to win because you're invoking a revelation of a name you borrowed from the preacher. Tonight God says, I want to meet you and show you who I am for yourself. So you walk away with your own revelation of who Jesus is. So nobody can shake you up the solid foundation. Come on, shake yourself free. Come on, come on. I know we've been here a while, but just shake yourself free. Shake yourself free. See, 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 you can't, you can't work in deliverance on somebody else's word. You can't use a name somebody else preach. You got to get it for yourself. This man's using borrowed truth. Proverbs said, I don't care what it costs to get truth, pay it. And I don't care what they offer you to take it from you. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. This generation is trying to present you all kinds of things for you to sell your soul. To sell your truth. He said, once you own it, don't give it up. This man has borrowed truth. The next thing he's got is he got an edge that slips out of his hand. Nothing worse than a gift that used to have an edge and no longer has it. Nothing worse than a preacher that used to have a word sharper than a two-edged sword that could change your life. But the next time he hits you, it's with blunt force, trauma. They've lost their edge. There's people in life that used to have an edge, but they've lost their edge. Now his edge is lost. So the, so the edge of his passion got lost. Holy Spirit said, ask my men, where did you lose your edge? Somebody has been trying to reinvent their life, but the edge of your passion got drowned in your details. The edge of your self-control drowned in your schedule. The edge of your passionate pursuit drowned in the obstacles of life. He lost his edge. He's doing the same thing and getting less done because he lost his edge. You look like you're working harder than you used to work and the thing ain't coming down. It's not because you're not doing the right thing. It's because you lost your edge. Tell somebody, get your edge back. Come on. I got good news for you now because the prophet came to the man and he said, show me where you lost it. You can't solve it if you don't source it. Show, show me where you lost it. I can't heal you if you hide it. God can't heal what you hide. Adam, where art thou? I want to heal you, but as long as you hide, I can't heal. So you got to be transparent. I'm preaching to chairs. Are y'all with me tonight? So, so, so he said, he said, man of God, take me to where you lost it. He took him to the place that he lost it. So God said, tonight, I'm going to remind my sons where they lost their passion. I'm going to remind my sons where they lost their courage. I'm going to remind my sons where they lost their zeal for God. I'm going to remind them when they believed me and the wind got knocked out of them and they didn't just lose their breath, they lost their faith. And God said, you've been moving forward like you still had the faith you used to have, but you lost it. And tonight, God said, I'm going to show you where you lost it. Because I'm going to help you recover what you lost. 
Somebody know I'm talking to somebody up in here. That's why it's quiet. I'm t- somebody, God, God said, I'm going to show you where I lost it. Not, not to shame you, but because to go to the next dimension, I have to remind you who I said you were before the battle made you think you weren't it. Hallelujah. If we're being real, sometimes you can get into a fight that talks you out of who God said you were. Can I stay there for a little bit? Sometimes you can get into a battle where you forget you are anointed. That's why David had to show up for his brothers. His brothers had military might, but they faced a giant that made them forget the God they were called to serve. So David had to show up and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The Lord is going to deliver his head to us today. God is reminding you, you are anointed. You are powerful. You are a warrior. You are here for such a time as this. You stand in this very room because God anointed and determined that you would be here before time began. You will make a difference in your community. Your sons will raise up and serve God. You will get free of that addiction. You shall be loosed of every bondage the enemy tried to throw in your life. The schools around you will change. I have called you for this. Somebody for 10 seconds just thank God for giving us back the edge we lost. Restore the edge to your men, God. Restore the edge to your sons, God. Give somebody a high five and say, change what you seek it. You, you can be seated, but don't fall asleep on a brother. Come on. He, 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 he said, take me to where you lost it. Where, where did you lose it? So, so Saul is on a journey. When we read 1 Samuel chapter 9, Saul is looking for something he lost. Saul is hunting for something he's supposed to have but doesn't. Saul is told by his dad to go seek for something his family is supposed to possess but got away. Saul Saul is like every man realizing that in my pursuits I am actually after something that belongs to me but I don't feel like I have it anymore. Oh, yeah, now, because in the heart of every person is this desire for something that you can't find in the world. And so what really, when we go to drugs, we're not really looking for drugs. We're looking for something else, and drugs happen to be available. Y'all not going to help me tonight. And a lot of times, we're not looking for the bottom of the 10th bottle. We're just looking for something else, and the bottle tasted so good. I thought I would find it, and when I get there, I still don't have it. I, I, I wasn't really looking for this. I got any women in here? I'm going to say something that would have got me in trouble. I wasn't looking for it. Yeah, but the reality is I, I, something in me is lost. I'm just grabbing something to mask it. I have found a good band-aid. That's right. That's right. That's all I've really done. And now I've been deceived to think it's that I want, but it ain't. It's something else I think I get in that, but I don't. Saul is searching. He's looking for donkeys. He's looking for something that is in his family line, but no longer exists. Dear Lord. The donkey is a rebellious nature until you teach it to be an obedient nature. The reality is the human family, all of us, have something God gave us, but rebellion drove it from us. And we go through life blindly searching to feel the absence what we lost left. Dear God. And now the challenge with Saul is I looked in this city and didn't find it. I talked to these people and didn't find it. I went to that place and didn't find it. I even got help to find it and I still didn't find it. And now in your search for something that is lost, you became lost. So now you're looking for a lost thing as a lost man. See, this this is the whole story uh, from Adam, Genesis. I can preach Genesis 2. This is the whole story uh, from the beginning. Adam lost a thing, and in his search for a thing, he lost himself. And all of humanity after Adam is to find this ache inside that I lost, that I know I'm supposed to have, but I can't get it anymore. 
See, Adam gets put out of the garden and swords go back and forth because he can't eat of the tree of, of life because he would be eternally in a fallen state. So Adam is consistently now living in a state where he looks from the outside at something he used to be on the inside of. So now he's held out of what God said was his. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. Now, no matter how long and far I try to reach, what I know is mine is out of my grasp. That's why Jesus said the kingdom is at hand my God I came to put it back in reach hallelujah this what you really need I just came to you what you couldn't get to I brought to you anybody glad for Jesus Jesus said you can't get in without me so I'm gonna get in without you I'm gonna do it for you oh so now I can do it through you hallelujah but but Saul you gotta change what you're seeking and so like him, you know, we're lost, we're aching, we're broken, we're looking, we're trying to find it. And Saul doesn't even realize this like us. Saul is looking for something he lost. And his servant says, there's a man of God in this city. If I can get to that city, maybe he can explain to us how to get back home. I, oh God. Did I go there? I'm not going to do that. Let me get he said, now look, he said, there's a man of God who can help me see where we lost it and help me get back where I'm supposed to be. And then the story picks up with Samuel. Everybody say Samuel. Samuel. Bible says that Samuel heard in his ear the day before, I'm sending a man to you that you will anoint as commander of my people. Now this don't make no sense to me, y'all. I just read... That Saul's dad, Kish, told him to go find some lost donkeys. Did I not? Yeah. I, just, I just heard his natural daddy tell him he's sending him to find these donkeys. And God had the nerve to tell the prophet, whose words never fell to the ground, I'm sending him. Y'all didn't hear it. Uh, yeah. Now, hold on. Did Kish send him? Or did God send him? So, so God said, I used your loss to get you where I needed to, to get you found. So God said, I love you so much. Even when the world puts you on the wrong assignment, I put my hand on you and get you in the right assignment. My God, I'm preaching. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. God takes your confusion and puts you right in the presence of clarity. Hallelujah. So you're stumbling and lost and can't find it. And God said, I was in it the whole time. Tell somebody, help me preach. Tell them he was in it the whole time. Come on. He was in it the whole time. He was there the whole time. If you looked up after the bottle was empty, he was there the whole time. If you looked up after the needle was dry, he was there the whole time. If you looked around after the sentence expired, he was there the whole time. God is great at taking lost folks and getting them found. I got to praise God for myself. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't give up on me. My God, slap your, slap your homie a high five and say, change what you're looking for. Come on. My God, I feel this thing. I feel this thing. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. He, said, he said, I'm going to direct your life. Now go back to uh, verse number 15. He said, I'm going to direct your life. Now, now Saul is a man of Benjamite. Now you got to understand a little bit about a Benjamite. He said, what do you mean I'm going to be anointed? I'm of the smallest clan. Me? He said, I'm the least of the least of the least. You know God has called you to stuff you can't even believe? You know God has called you to be so great, you'll try to talk yourself out of it? You know God believes more in you than you do? God said, yeah, I've anointed you. He said, me? So God will anoint the most unlikely candidate, the most unlikely candidate. 
God said, you're a Benjamite. Now, you got to understand about Benjamin. Can I preach for a little bit? I got to release this over you. Can I? You got to understand. Rachel was having a hard time bearing children. And the Lord opened her womb, didn't he? And gave her two boys. And the last one is this Benjamite guy. Y'all know Benjamin. She wants to name that boy son of my sorrow. Because she bore him in pain. She bore him on the labor bed of death. You know, oh death, where is your sting? So death tried to create a name for the baby. Death tried to label the generation. Death tried to create an identity on your son. Death tried to create an identity on your life. But the father who's watching his beloved wife die says his name shall not be son of my sorrows. It shall be Benjamin, son of my right hand. So Jesus said, death is calling you son of sorrow and said, I'm going to sit at the right hand of God and you're going to sit with me. We serve a father who steps in and changes your name. I don't care what pain tried to birth you and call you what you went through. God says, not on my watch. Fathers ascribe identity. The identity comes from the father. Oh, my God. So the father overrode the label of the earth and said, I ascribe identity. You're a son of my right hand. I got to prophesy to somebody. Your identity is not defined by what you've been through, but you got a father who stepped in and changed your name and said, you belong at my right hand. Go back to that verse. I know I was slow, but go back to that verse. Let me. You getting anything out of this? Now, Lord had told, told Samuel in his ear a uh, day before Saul came, saying, verse 16, Tomorrow about this time I'll send the man of Benjamin out of the land of Benjamin. Now, I want you to understand this. You shall anoint him, be captain of my people of Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their city has come to me next part. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, the man of whom I spoke to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Now you're going to stand. God knew the moment he would arrive in the presence of the man of God. God said he's going to do it about this time tomorrow. <laughs> so at that time the next day, a man who was looking for donkeys on behalf of his father being led to a place by a God he didn't know. We know that because he asked the seer who the seer was. Saul was so spiritually ignorant, he's standing in the face of the seer and doesn't know it's him. And the seer had to say, I am he. God can anoint you even when you're not ready for the moment. Because the power of right place will override your ignorance. If I can just get you in the room about this time tomorrow, your life will be totally different. I'm saying to somebody in this room today, there is an about this time tomorrow anointing for somebody in this room. I was, it, I'm not going to say, I was in, should I say this? I'll say this for somebody's faith. I, let me, give me 30 seconds. I, I was in a place and, and, and the Lord came on me so strong and we began to proclaim about this time tomorrow, about this time tomorrow, contracts will be given, jobs will be unlocked. And there was a man in that room who came to the altar who had been looking for a job for two years, two years. And every job he applied for, they kept telling him, you're overqualified, you're overqualified, you're overqualified, you're overqualified, two years. This man armor bared for me and all this stuff. And we began to proclaim about this time tomorrow, about this time tomorrow, about this time tomorrow. I went to lunch with the pastor an hour after service on a Sunday. Yes, 
that man had called the pastor and said, you won't believe this. A job I applied for called me on Sunday and said, we're closed. I don't even know why I'm calling you. Come in tomorrow. We're going to give you the job. And matter of fact, we're going to pay you 20000 more than we all. Oh, God Almighty. We're going to give you 20000 more than it says on the website. Before he got to the next day, the man had a job he couldn't get for two years. It's the Holy Ghost, y'all. About this time tomorrow, somebody's life can totally change. Somebody shout, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. God knows every detail of your life. All of them. God knew you'd be here tonight. God knew you'd be listening to Mr. Lightskin at 10, 15, 9, 15. 9, 15. Amen. He knew you'd be seeing the real rock at 9.15. I got front row encouragement. Amen. I, I, got, I got back row heads nodding. Hallelujah. To somebody God is saying, tomorrow it's all changing. Your marriage was about to be done tonight. Tomorrow, love is going to be stirred because God is going to take you to where you lost it. Tomorrow, somebody. He said, this is the man I spoke to of. I, I, God knows every detail of your life. The problem with you, Saul, is you've spent your life seeking the wrong stuff. Go to Matthew 6, 33. I'm about to be done. The problem is, the problem is Saul, you seeking the wrong stuff. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So let me back up. You got a man in his heart that knows he's seeking something he's lost. In his pursuit to satisfy an internal brokenness that he can't find a way to satisfy, he realizes it's not just something he lost, it is him that is lost. In his lost state, God put his hand on and said, I'm sending you to a place to change and to give you what you're looking for. He runs into a man named Samuel that God says, I'm going to anoint you king. So Samuel is a man with the anointing of kings in his spirit. So when he finds what he is actually looking for, it is not the donkeys. How do we know that? Because he said the donkeys were found days ago. You lost them three days ago. The donkey's been found. So it's found and you still looking. So it's not the donkey you needed. It was the kingdom anointing you needed. What got you on the journey is you really lost the kingdom. Dear God. I'm telling every man in this room, the thing in you that aches that you can't fill with anything else is actually a need for the kingdom. Because God gave you the kingdom before he gave you your mother's belly. But you woke up in a generation that was dead like Rachel's belly, that was dead and tried to name you son of my sorrow. But what God is doing is arranging your steps to realize what you've always been called to is the kingdom of God. You've been seeking all this stuff and stuff has been subtracting from you. But when you seek first the kingdom, all this will be added unto you, my God in heaven. What you really need is only satisfied in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, I'm going to preach to myself. God said, I used all of that fake mask covering stuff to show you the only thing that can satisfy what you ache for is that kingdom right there. Tell three people, seek the kingdom, seek the kingdom, seek the kingdom, seek the kingdom. Because, can I teach for a little bit? Watch, let me release this. Because you were designed to function in kingdom authority. You were designed to speak and the world respond to your voice. So now you speak up and it keeps rebelling. When you were actually designed to speak and it respond. But Adam lost his authority when he got into rebellion. So now stuff that used to listen to him is running away from him. But Jesus gets up on the boat and says, peace be still. And it responds to his voice. What manner of man is this? It's not supposed to be only in Jesus. It's supposed to be in you and 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 me. Because we have a thing in the, oh God. Because we were born for the kingdom of God. You're supposed to be able to speak to sickness and sickness obey. Speak to our my God in heaven. Tell somebody, change what you're seeking. Let me, let me keep going. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let me teach this principle that will change your life and I'll finish, I promise. Be seated. I'll stir you back up in a minute. <laughs> I know you're getting tired. I'm going to get you home, I promise. Watch this. I got to show you this. The kingdom of God is a ranking world in the Holy Ghost. <sighs> I can't teach the kingdom deep right now. I'm not going to do it. The kingdom of God is a divine rule in the realm of the spirit. So the Bible says, in him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. It says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not righteousness, peace, and joy with the Holy Ghost. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Everything you have in the kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. We teach the Holy Spirit as the governor of the kingdom. He is. But he is also the actual world the kingdom exists in. He governs it because he is the essence of it. When God created everything, the Bible says, oh, how am I getting here? That he created everything through Christ. The word Christ is word and anointing. You understand? Word and spirit. So everything in creation came out of God. When nothing was there, God made everything you see by reaching into himself and pulling it out. He released his word and his spirit. So when earth fall in order in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and 3, without form and void darkness over the face of the deep, the Bible says, and the spirit hovered. Over the face of the waters. Because to remake it, I need to use the same tools I used to make it in the first place. Whatever it takes to get it, it will take to maintain it and to re-get it. So I can't just say, light be. I need to send my spirit over it and then say, light be. Because it's in the Holy Spirit, my God. I have to combine word and spirit and what I need will manifest. You got some people with spirit and no word and other people with word and no spirit. But the letter kills and the spirit gives life. God, God, so God says, I am birthing everything you need out of the realm of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is an order. How do I get here? The kingdom is an order. I'm, I'm, give me, can I have seven minutes? The kingdom of God is an order. And what God says is, if you want to get your life in line with the kingdom, you got to seek it and come in line with an order. Okay? The word seek means to set your sights on and hunt for like it's all you desire. That word seek means like a hunter or an archer who sets his sniper sights on his prey and doesn't see anything else but that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. First means there's a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. There can't be a first if there's not a tenth. So the order of the kingdom is if you seek the kingdom second, nothing will be added to you. The kingdom doesn't settle for second place. The kingdom doesn't take a back seat. So the promises will partially work if you put the kingdom in a back seat. The kingdom demands first place. Behold, O Israel, the Lord thy God are one. I'm the only one you're going to serve. And if you put a God before me, replace me, put it in another place, then what you need from me, you won't get. Because the kingdom cannot just be sought. It has to be sought first. If you get the first thing out of order, everything is out of order. Come on, men, now. Stay up with me for five more minutes. If you get the first thing out of order, I don't care what else you do. It's all out of order. You can't be in order if the first thing is out of order. So he said, get the first thing in order. And you'll find stuff you've been looking for starts looking for you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. 
because you lost the ability to command creation and it respond because the kingdom became last priority. But when I get it back in the right priority, the stuff you spend your life after is going to start coming after you. My God, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, every one of them is going to be added to you. It might not be added to you in the time frame you desire, but it's going to be added to you if you seek. The word seek is to seek and keep on seeking. It's to seek and not fall short in your seeking. It's to seek and seek when you don't think you got it, you keep seeking. He said, if you will get this thing first, stuff will be added to you because the order is right. You know what the problem is? When you get something broken that is supposed to do something it was built to do and it doesn't do it, what is it called? Out of order. It's not just that it doesn't work. It's that something in it mixed up the order. The order ain't right. My God. He said, seek the kingdom of God first and you will, everything else will be added to you. So Saul, the problem is, the reason why what you're looking for is not being added to you is because you got the seer, the kingdom of God, nowhere on your priority list. So what I've got to do is I've got to change your priorities and your pursuits. If I can change what you prioritize, I will help you find what you lost. If I can change your priority, uh, I can change what you have in you that's missing. I just have to fix the priority. So Jesus said, get this right. Get this first. I'm done right here. Go to the next one with me in uh, Matthew chapter number 19. I'm going to read these fast and then we get to where God's telling me to go. Matthew chapter number 19. And behold, one came and said to him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? He said to him, why you call me good? There's no one good but God. But if you will enter into life, just keep the commandments. It's the rich young ruler. He said to him, which? Jesus said, you shall not murder all this stuff. Next verse. And uh, he says, honor your father and mother. Next verse. I, I've done this stuff. What do I lack? Next verse. If you want to be perfect, mature, a man that I can trust, go and sell what you have. Give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. I watch the next verse. But when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful. So the question is, are you willing to pay the price to go after what God says you're supposed to put first? And it ain't about his possessions. It's about any attachment you deem more worthy than your kingdom pursuit. What is causing you to turn and walk away? I'm not paying that price. No, I don't know about that one. Go to the next set of scriptures I had for you. I think it was Matthew 13. Here it is. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hidden in a field. Everybody say a treasure. treasure. That which a, when a man had found it, he hideth and for joy thereof, what he do? So he did the exact opposite thing of this guy. Who refused to let go of his stuff in the world. This man said, I have found a treasure that's been hidden from me my whole life. I don't care what I have to give up. I will give it all up to get that field. My God. Our life won't be in order until we're willing to confront the things that have replaced the kingdom. What I need us to ask ourselves is, am I ready to let it go? Am I ready to let it go? Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent. I was in a dream and the Holy Spirit showed me this years ago. Give me a little something. The Holy Spirit showed me this years ago. I was in a dream and I saw myself preaching. And I was preaching the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And the Holy Spirit jumped in that dream essentially by his voice and said, the number one violence that the kingdom suffers is human will. When the kingdom is working to invade in the earth, 
its number one opponent is the carnal mind. There's something in this world that's pulling you away from what you know should be first. And God is asking men tonight, if we could be bold and honest, am I willing to let that go to finally apprehend the thing I've always needed and get all these other things now finally added to my life? And nobody can answer that but me. So I just want for five minutes, I'm done. I want to open up the altar. I want to open up your chair, the, your little space. And I don't care what you make of it. Somebody, this word's for you. It might be two of us. But the Holy Spirit essentially said, I'm coming to ask you, are you ready to let it go? How bad do you want what is out of order in order? Can I move this, Pastor? You can, man of God. Thank you, sir. So if we could just for a moment, let's just close our eyes. I promise we won't be here all night. And I just want you to give your attention to heaven. I just want you to allow the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that maybe we've put in front of him. And let the Spirit of God challenge you to say, it's time to let that go. Put the kingdom first. Put the kingdom first. Spirit of God, in a few moments, I'm going to make a call and give some guys a chance to come here and as a sign that they're letting it go. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, even as you have been speaking to us all night, even in the worship and the praise and on the way here, there are some of us in here who say, you know what, I've tried it all, I've done it all, and I'm still lacking something inside. I thought I've served you right, but, but it's all out of order. Tonight, I'm deciding to make the kingdom my top priority. And I'm making Jesus my number one pursuit. Spirit of God, I ask you, reveal to us those things that are in the way of our divine pursuit. Now, men, I'm going to count to three. I want you to keep your eyes closed. There might be two or three. If you feel like this is for you, I want you to come up to this altar and just for two minutes, give it over to God. As the prophetic psalmist began to declare, I give myself away. I give you my heart. If you want it, you got it. That, that was all prophetic tonight because God came to introduce you to you. I already got a man coming up here. I don't want you to wait. One, two, three. If that's you, come on, let's just get to this altar. I'll get out of your way. It, it might be four of us. I don't care. I know what God told me to say. Spirit of God, wow. Wow. I didn't expect this. Wow. Now, if maybe you say, I'm not coming to the altar, but, but can you make your chair an altar for just about two minutes, and I'm going to hand this over to your pastor. And for those who are not, let's just stand to our feet, and if you feel like kneeling or getting in the aisle, do what you got to do. That's okay. And let's just begin to seek God and turn it over to Him. <laughs> honor every man who made a decision tonight I, I want to give pastors permission if I can any pastors in here who want to pray at the altar feel free is that okay Pastor Bobby Pastor Rob you as well if God puts anything in your heart Pastor Mario feel free to pray let's just surround these men of God and let's just begin to pray hey hey sir Spirit of God began to just tell me, you've lost much. You've lost much. I'm, I'm seeing even as a young man, you had to deal with loss way too early. Does that make sense? Way too early. Father, mother, drug. You, you had to deal with loss way too early. You had to fight yourself through life without proper guidance and without proper direction. God said tonight, I sent you here to recover what you lost. The affection you didn't have, I'm giving it to you. The appreciation you didn't have, I'm giving it to you. The Lord said there were even things that you did to try to get those things, but they didn't answer. But God said tonight, I am all of it for you. What you have searched for, I'm now responding to it. Does that make sense, man? God said tonight, he's going to cloak you fresh. Oh, halabashi. And release a measure of peace over you. 
I even see in your pursuits like job searching and looking for what it is that you'll do next, but I see your path becoming straight. I see your path becoming straight, like crooked ways being made straight. And you're going to find an accelerated road to the next thing God is bringing you to. I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. Father, fresh anointing. Yeah. Yeah. Release it, son. Release it. You were mishandled, but God said, I anointed you as a boy. I chose you as a young man. I knew you before mom's belly. I picked you out and set you aside. Even when it was rough, my eye was on you. My hand is on you. You will see things that have been tight upon you, loose off of you in the name of Jesus. Another man, another man. Hey. Another man, another man. Another man. The Lord says, he's changing you to another man, another man, another man. He's changing the man, the man, he's changing the man. Stand up for me, son. A man, a man. I can't really sing. That's the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let them lead us. Oh, oh. Hallelujah. 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 Man of God, the Lord says you are handpicked. You are chosen. He pulled you out of rough for a reason. My God. He is releasing an anointing over you. The Spirit of God says, I'm going to make you an influencer with those around you. You have even thought, why is it that I have a natural attraction about my life? And the world tried to manipulate it and the world tried to pull on it and the world tried to pervert it but God said it is me who put it in you it is me who made you a naturally assertive man who could attract and they thought it was charisma and they thought it was an aura but it is my spirit God said and what the enemy tried to change and pervert and make wrong God said tonight I'm releasing an anointing over you son and you will carry the spirit of the living God and you will walk in a manifestation of his presence and your hands will be filled with the fire of the almighty and you will speak and people will listen for he will use you even as as like an evangelist in some ways you will speak of the name of jesus and people in your friend circle and family circle will be saved as i lay my hands i release fire in the name of jesus fire in the name of jesus an evangelical oh hey ya da 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 ya hey ya da ba in the name of awaken every gift awaken every gift hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. Come on, men, we're about to be done. Just continue to seek Him. I give myself away. So you Fresh favor. Fresh favor. Man of God, the Lord says He's given you fresh favor. He's given you fresh favor, fresh grace, fresh influence. Somebody is going to see you and give you a chance. There's a fresh favor coming over you. What you have been passed over for. What you have felt passed over regarding God says, I'm now going to release in the name of Jesus. You will no longer be last. I will make you first in that area. Hey, favor. I can't sing, y'all. I just love Jesus. Come on, let's just worship. I promise. Three more minutes.
done but every pastor I just want to pray over pastors Lord God release a fresh anointing of expansion every church every itinerant ministry every apostle prophet evangelist pastor or teacher expand the work of their hands open up portals in this region open the heavens over every house release dimensions of revival in the name of Jesus Restir those who have not come back to the house of God. Let there be an awakening in Jesus' name. Pastor Mario, you go back to Orlando with fresh fire and fresh anointing and fresh grace. Man of God, even as you stand to preach, you will preach with a new dimension of authority. You will preach with new codes and revelation. God said, get ready to write like never before. Get ready to pin like never before. God said, write the vision. Vision is revelation. God is downloading kingdom revelation. God is downloading deep insights of the spirit. Your church will say, this man changed. This man preaches under a heavenly validation. This man is standing in a new anointing. We decree the spirit of familiarity break around you. Those who have taken you for granted. Those who have thought they are just like you. God says, I'm dealing with that. And I'm releasing a fresh wisdom into your spirit. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Downloads. Woo. Codes, revelations, insights, dimensions. 
No, watch out. He might get up on stage and start picking people out of the crowd. Hallelujah. I know some had to leave. But out here, we're done when God's done. One more thing over Pastor Bobby in this house. I just, in my spirit as I was down there, the Lord showed me that you are in a season of recovery. You're in a season of recovery. Beyond what we've discussed, man of God, you're in a season of recovery. And the Lord showed me the acts of the prophet falling into the water. And the Lord said, what you thought was lost is not lost. It is still there. It is still there. They are still there. The Lord says, it looks like you're drowning right now. It looks like you're drowning right now. But the axe head will float again, says the Lord. I am sending my word. And what was on the bottom of the ocean shall rise to the top. He is taking you to where it was lost. I declare in the name of Jesus, your hour of recovery has come. Come forth, everything that is buried. Come forth, everything that was lost. Lord said, even, Lord said, even as the man of God had to get the staff, he had to grab a branch and throw it in the water. And when he took the stick and he threw it in the water, he told the man of God that lost it, he said, you get it. God says there is a natural element you're going to throw into the dimension of what was lost and it will be what restores what has been buried. God said, I am making known to you your branch. He says, son, it is your staff in the name of Jesus. It is your staff. He said, I am putting a strategy in your hand. I'm putting a branch in your hand. I'm putting that which is natural in your hand. And son, you have wondered if the thing in your hand that is natural will affect the thing that is invisible. But God said, indeed, this natural element will be the very thing that causes heaven to respond. And this natural thing is a prophetic tool to cause what has been sinking to rise again. My God. He said, you will not be drowned. You will not suffocate long. You will not see your end in this hour. You are not done and you are not over. God said, what I have put in your hand is more than enough. What I have put in your hand is more than enough. God said, I used what was lost to make you run to me. And you're running to me. I'm giving you a strategy. And the hour is coming where I will tell you, pick it up. It's recovered in Jesus name. We seal it in the name of Jesus over you and Pastor Kimberly. You see it with your own eyes. Son, you have wondered if you would see some of these things. God said you will see it with your own eyes. You will. You will. Your eyes will not grow dim. You will see it. And you will see it suddenly. Now, Lord, you said that we would war with prophecy. And so we bind the word of every witch in the name of Jesus. We bind the word of every power that comes against this in the name of Jesus. We bind every demonic deterrent in Jesus' name. We command recovery in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sealed by your spirit. For the perfection of the manifestation in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 